Okay, I can start. Okay. Can pop. Uh, yeah, so we're going to do this in English. Uh, and this uh, talk is about Shelter 2, which is an upcoming game of Might and Delight. Uh, but we will start about, uh, to talk a little bit about which titles that Might and Delight has done before. I have this. Oh, right. Might and Delight is a small company where are eight to ten people uh, in uh, Stockholm. And uh, we've released this game, which is called PID, which is a platform adventure game. Uh, have anyone played it here? Yay, that's more than I... Oh, good, okay. Uh, did you like it? Yep. Oh, yes. oh, I could have... Okay. <laughs> yeah, and next slide, please. And uh, recently we, re we released this game, the Blue Flamingo. It's uh, all made of hand-modeled models in real life. This level that you fly over is eight meters long. And uh, it's all built in a studio, but... Uh, by a really good uh, model crafter, uh, Anders Hellström. Uh, also in uh, Stockholm, and he's done a lot of commercials, like uh, Come Hem commercials and stuff with dolls and models. So that's really what Might and Delight is about. We contact people and then contact us, and we'll do artsy games with people from different uh, areas. Yeah, <coughs> next one. And we're here to talk about Shelter 2, but we will also talk a little about the prequel, Shelter 1. Have anyone played Shelter 1? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, then you know it's a game about Badger and Badger Mom that uh, uh, will uh, take care of her cubs through like six levels or so. Uh, and it's very uh, illustrative. It's made to look like a flat 2D painting but in a 3D world. Uh, yep, next one. Now it's, uh, well, presentations. Uh, 2006, I left Visby, the game education, and started to work in this company, Grin. Uh, that was the biggest uh, game developer in Sweden a while, like 350 people. Uh, we released games like Bionic Commando, Wanted, Terminator, uh, Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter and 2 for PC. It's a totally different game for consoles and PC. And then when that went bankrupt, I joined a little company with like seven people called A Different Game. Uh, we made uh, Nintendo DSi games, but uh, it was never released, so it doesn't really count. And after that, I joined the team at Might and Delight. Uh, and been working a little bit with Rovio and a little bit with Togaboka and release games over there. So it's Jens' turn. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Jens, but uh, around here I'm more called the Tiny. Uh, <laughs> so I started at the Game Education 2011, and it was game design and programming. Uh, and how I got to uh, Might and the Light was by internship. So at the start of my third year, I started, to, uh, started applying to a lot of places. Uh, and I pitched myself as a generalist, as a game designer, programmer, and uh, producer, because that's what I've been doing uh, in my GDC projects. Uh, so I got an internship there as a programmer. Uh, so I started in February. Uh, and then, after a while, they decided they wanted to keep me and pay me for what I do. Uh, so now I'm here, and I'm... Um, what I worked on mainly during this time is gameplay programming for Shelter 2. And then I've done a lot of small tasks beside that, like uh, website maintenance, and I uh, did a little, little stuff on um, the Blue Flamingo. So before I got to Might and Delight, I did a few games that some of you might recognize here from the school. So the large one was, um, larger ones was one brawler with pubertal wizards, and one puzzle game for children with magical bubbles. Uh, and then I've also done a ton of weird prototypes and game jam games, among one with uh, one where you help a horse brush their teeth, <laughs> uh, and one that is about drinking coffee and daydreaming. Uh, but now, Peter will talk a bit about the prequel. Yeah. So, next slide. 
Yeah, as you know, or well, most of you know, it's a game where you're a bedroom mom and uh, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, li a linear gameplay. Uh, it's very boxed in. You go from point A to point B, very simple. And all you do is actually feed the cubs and protect the cubs from one danger that is presented in every level. Uh, it was supposed to be, and I hope it is, emotional illustrative, forgiving. You can't die. Uh, your cubs die, but you can't die. And realism was not important in this game. It was most, mostly a focus on this. And it's not a simulator. Okay, let's do a trailer. Let's show you a trailer so you know for the guys that haven't, and girls that haven't played it. You have to escape. Yeah. Oops. No. Sorry. My bad. Yeah, so we will talk about Might and Delight's art philosophy. Uh, we design our games based on that we are a really small team and mostly one artist. So a good art director has a deep understanding of what takes time when he designs the game and what the technical difficulties will be, the most, the most difficult thing in the game and then he can reduce the art to what we can manage and make it still and still make it pretty. Or listens to a technical artist that has a say in a matter and knows what he's talking about. So let's take PID, for example, which is uh, for a um, regular player like eight hours long. And it's 30, 35 levels. I can't really remember the exact amount. But uh, here we did a trick that we only have consistent colors in the background, simply shaded. Um, oh, yeah, I actually have notes for this. Yeah. So, only one artist in this game. So how can we pull this off? Well, simple shaded background objects with no textures, thus uh, relieving us from uh, UV mapping all of the objects. Uh, interactable objects and characters are nicely shaded with reflection, light, but still only simple colors. Also time-consuming if you want to uh, texture them with the uh, details and such. And this game is played usually on a smaller screen than this, so it needs to be clear 
to the player, what he sees and what he can interact with. So, heavy emphasis on light. It's like light was the main thing that made this game look good. And most of the light is actually hand-placed gradient nodes. So, almost no real-time lightning. The only real-time lightning is on the characters. Everything else is uh, gradient spots uh, placed on the prefabs and objects. Shelter. Uh, also only one artist, although I had two really good uh, interns from here. Uh, abstract textures based on uh, Japanese common patterns. I will talk a little bit about that later in this presentation, how we design the patterns, because the patterns is really what makes shelter look like shelter. Uh, we uh, embrace the fact that textures is a rep repetitive art form, so we made patterns that actually look good being repetitive and not trying to hide it. Uh, no shadows or light, so that uh, made it, uh, things a lot easier for me. Uh, yeah, uh, this is just a tiny piece of the information we'll get, but still, do people have questions about anything that I've talked about? Oh, you do. Yeah, uh, which engine do you use? Unity. Or, okay. Yeah. All our projects are made in Unity. Okay. Yeah. Are you the artist or the programmer? I'm the artist and somewhat the technical artist, depending on the titles. So I do a, a bit of both. You? What was the development time for Shelter? Oh, uh, Oh, I, I forgot so easy. It's like seven months. Yeah. Nine months? Yeah. Wait. Yeah, supposed to be seven. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nine months. <laughs> yes? What were your working schedules like? Um, what do you mean? Or did you ever have any crunch times? Uh, we try to stay away from crunch times. When we created Might and Delight, that was one of the things. because. Uh, We've been working at Green. Almost the entire team had worked at Green before, and we crunched the hell out of us. So we we felt that if we try to uh, focus and have a good time schedule, and so we yeah, but eight hours a day and try not to crunch was the thing. Even though when we do trailers and stuff, it it's a, we always crunch because uh, yeah we want to polish our material that we release so people buy our game. Uh, not new impl implementations as such, more, more or less that everyone should be on time, do the work, focus, and I mean it's, it's not a secret formula, it's like if you have a good team that's possible. If you don't, and if you have a producer that uh, can't handle people or plan the time correctly, that's, uh, I mean it's a recipe for failure. Any more? Let's, huh? let's see. So let's uh, go to the big one, Shelter 2. Oh, should I? <laughs> so Shelter 2 is the spiritual successor to Shelter 1, uh, meaning that we have kept the uh, format of uh, a story being told about motherhood, but we have changed the animal and we have changed some of the gameplay. So Shelter 1 was a really calm game, and Shelter 2 is also at many points. But we wanted to make it more action-oriented, which we have made with the hunting mechanics. So the interaction model of the hunting is a bit like uh, hide-and-seek and playing tag. Because firstly you have to slowly sneak up on your prey, and then you have to run up to them to catch them. So the challenge of the gameplay here is to uh, is to outsmart the fleeing patterns of the animals. And we did have a more complicated uh, process before this where you had to jump and time clicks, but that didn't really fit the feeling of hunting, so we just abstracted that away so, uh, so that running after something is the main thing you do. And when we looked at 
the new animal we've chosen. We have looked at Lung's behaviors when we have designed gameplay, but it hasn't been a constraint for us. So um, a good example of a feature that we have implemented with Lynx's in mind is uh, sniffing. I think I have. Yeah. So when you sniff, you um, prey animals get red tinted, and the rest of the world get uh, toned down. So we solved a problem of player readability that it was hard to find the prey animals with this, uh, and it also didn't feel forced, but it's rather. Uh, increase the feeling of being a predator. The big difference between Shelter 1 and Shelter 2 is that the main character moves so much faster. So you really have to spot them at a distance and sneak up on them. While in Shelter 1, um, the levels are much, 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 much smaller. And uh, everything you can eat is usually in front of you. Yeah. Uh, and there has been some times in the development when people have sheltered realism and cats don't do that, mm. but that hasn't really been important. It's not a simulator. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because lynxes are excellent swimmers and they climb trees, but they don't swim in shelter because it's really nifty to have water to cut the players off from areas, and climbing trees would be really uh, a bitch to implement and make it look good. Uh, so the mother role is the central part of Shelter 2. And as in Shelter 1, you keep feeding and protecting your cubs. Uh, the thing that is different about feeding them in Shelter 2 is that you can eat yourself. Uh, and that will boost your stamina, which will make it easier for you to hunt and get more food. Uh, so there is a bit of a choice going on there. We did have so that you could starve to death yourself. But that removed too much focus from the cubs. So we removed entirely that you can die from starvation, and it's just a boost to your... Uh, to your hunting abilities to get the focus back to taking care of the cubs. It took a long time for us to get to that point where we understood that uh, it was actually obstructing the sensation of taking care of your cubs instead of uh, immersing the player into the game. The player got frustrated more than it helped. Yeah. Uh, and also new thing about uh, parenting in this game is that you can carry the cubs. So when you're, uh, they are small, like they are here, you can pick them up in your mouth and carry them around. Uh, and I personally like this feature because it gives you uh, more control of the cubs. So for example, you can carry them to a stream and they will start drinking. Uh, and it's also if you're fleeing from danger, you can carry your favorite cub to make sure that it won't <laughs> lie behind. <laughs> Everyone has one of those, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I. Uh, I enjoy that it's, uh, it's going to be a tough choice for the player because the other cubs are still vulnerable and can't run as fast as you. Um, their behavior also develops with the game because they grow up during the game. So in the beginning they are really playful and dependent and they keep close to you. But then they grow up and they get more independent and start wandering around and they don't need you as much. And an example of this is that the small cubs can stop and demand to be carried. And if you ignore that, they will lag behind and be more vulnerable. Uh, uh, question? I have a question. Yeah? Uh, people said that people have their favorite cubs. Yeah? Do the cubs behave differently somehow? No, they're different, different colors. They're different colors. Red is tutor. Although people read into the behavior. It's, uh, it's amazing. When people play the game, it's like they, they in instantly feel for someone or dislikes uh, another one because maybe it got stuck behind a tree, I don't know, you know. So it's uh, this one can't behave, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. So uh, an example of how they behave when they're more mature is that the older cubs will start to hunt easier prey by themselves and so uh, contribute to the family. And we've had really positive response when players have seen this and like, oh, they're growing up, they're learning. Uh, so one of the biggest difference, differences between Shelter 1 and 2 is that Shelter 1 was really linear and you went from point A to point B and um, overcame dangers. So um, Shelter 2 is more open world. Uh, it has a static start and ending. But otherwise, you have three large areas to wander around in. Uh, and as a reference for you who have played Shelter 1, one of these areas are about as big as all of the Shelter 1 areas. 
so the um, the challenges of this is to to make the levels interesting and to make every place worth exploring. And of course, it's also been issues of optimization that, that we have a really large amount of objects and prey prey animals can't always be spawned on uh, the whole level and so forth. And in these areas, uh, we have dynamic events that can happen. And these are a bit of the same flavor as the dangers in Shelter 1, that you have to react to something. Uh, and they can be triggered based on things like the current season, the current area, the age of your cubs, and mostly it's random timers to make sure that something is happening every x time units. Uh, and the problem with this has been to make sure that they happen often enough for the gameplay to be scrambled around sometimes, but not be repetitive and happen all the time. Uh, we also have a season system that has added a lot to the scope. So we have seasons that change when you play, uh, and it's mostly visual changes, but it also uh, affects gameplay in ways like uh, the water turning to ice, so you can access new areas or access places more, um, more easily, and that in the winter, the easy-to-catch critters are gone. So it's hard to survive in the winter. Uh, so on the technical side, what has been the, the largest and most difficult thing to implement is the number of AI systems. Because we have the cubs that you see all the time that has to behave sensibly. We have the prey animals that uh, have to look good from afar, and they have to have interesting fleeing patterns that challenge the player. And then we have the wolves, who are the antagonists of the game, that have to behave uh, in a threatening way. So to implement this, uh, I have used finite state machines, because they are easy to implement and easy to debug. So there isn't any form of sexy AI in this. Uh, the only thing that isn't state machines is the Boyd's uh, system, which is flocking movement, that uh, a pack of wolves or a herd of deers move with consideration to each other uh, and don't bump in. And that isn't too complicated either, but an adaption of my third year AI programming uh, project. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the approach to coding at Might and Delight. Because um, the game design and player experience is always central to, and always goes before technical finesse. And of course you have to keep things optimized and, uh, uh, and so modular that you can keep working on it but no one really appreciates fancy systems for the sake of fancy systems. Uh, and I have a personal anecdote on that. I updated the prey spawning system for like a week ago because I had a system that I liked both as a designer and a coder. And it was dynamic and if you hunted rabbits they would stop to spawn and uh, they would get, uh, get eradicated from areas if you hunted a lot of rabbits there. But as this game should be forgiving it didn't fit the aesthetics at all. So instead now I just keep a lot of prey spawned around the player and as a result the game got more interesting because more time was spent on hunting than uh, looking for prey. Uh, um, a good uh, example is uh, the fire in uh, Shelter 1 which is a really stupid system. It's uh, mostly a, a wall of fire that uh, burns behind you and uh, I haven't met anyone that uh, tried to run into the fire but no one, you can't die from the fire and the cubs cannot die from the fire but everyone that plays the game thinks it's, it's a danger there so and, and, it, and it's also like uh, to have an advanced system because we started to talk about that in Shelter 1 how the fire should grow and everything and then, then it was like no fuck it just a wall of fire and, 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 it, gets, and it works perfectly and it's like the wolves I, I suggested in the beginning that the wolves should spawn uh, around the player, so you were uh, immediately surrounded by it. But then uh, it was downloaded, and with good reason, because you need to see the wolves uh, walking about in the world to make the world more alive. So there is a give and take in this, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and the last thing about the, uh, 
the coding technical side is that uh, we develop gameplay a lot by iteration and people come with crazy ideas over beer. So <coughs> uh, I've had to keep, keep, I've had to keep the code pretty iteration friendly. And when people has fought over things, I made toggleable modes. And this has been really nice for the design development. But the negative result right now is that we have really many variables that aren't used, or it's maybe someone who's still rooting for an old system, so I let it be. Uh, and it's, it's just become really, really messy in the end. Uh, and that was all about the gameplay. Do we have questions so far? Yeah? How did you work with the animation and the motions of the animals? Have you used some sort of motion capture, studied animals? Uh, our animators watch a lot of cat videos, but no motion capture. <laughs> <laughs> Deciding on the gameplay of Chapter 2, uh, was the first step, oh, we want to have a sphinx, or was the first step, oh, we want to have something fast that can hunt, or was the sort of path to there? Yeah. Um, the original concept was pitched by our CEO and art director, so they, uh, they developed the core concept themselves. But then, uh, in our process, we do discuss and test a lot of things, so most people of the team have uh, an impact on how the gameplay turns out. Uh, no? Then uh, Peter is going to talk a bit... Oh, sorry. Uh, back, first. <laughs> uh, how do your normal work day look like? Do you have a studio that you go to? And yeah, uh, we have an office in Stockholm. So, uh, normal work day is working 9 to 6. Uh, my personal work day is uh, <laughs> just. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, mean I, I come in, I make coffee, and I start to code. And then people bother me about things that are needed, needs to be done, and I direct them to Mantis and ask, ask them to report it there. Uh, sometimes we have meetings to just check on things, but we don't really have a steady routine of it. Uh, can you hunt badgers in chapter two? <laughs> we were really tempted, but we don't have badgers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Uh, as the title and shot guesses, is there a way to actually uh, settle yourself and your family in some sort of shelter? Um, like that? There is a den that uh, the player comes to to birth her cubs, uh, but there is a discussion going right now if it should have more purpose, because our test players have assigned it purpose, but it, um, we have only uh, um, assigned it the purpose of a uh, certain point in the world that you know and you can return to, and it's like you navigate from the den. It's a really good question, but the main focus about the den right now is to give birth in, and after that there is really no uh, really no value of staying there, which is the problem we realized a couple of weeks ago when we play tested it, because people tend to only stay around the, the den because they feel safe there. So yeah, it's uh, an ongoing discussion right now actually. Um, <laughs> okay, left. <laughs> yeah? Okay, uh, how do you navigate through the open world? Do you use visual elements that surround <laughs> the surroundings so you can, or is there some sort of Progression. Uh, we have a few different things for that. Uh, partly we've tried to design the level so you can see, okay, the waterfall is over there, then I need to go over here. Um, partly there are uh, symbols that appear when you sniff, which goes to key locations, like as, uh, such as going to your den. You can always sniff and see the symbol for, okay, this way it is. Uh, and then we implemented a map, really, um, really late in the development, and we are evaluating if that helps or how much of it we should keep. We didn't want to be specific on the map. It's like a mind map. You, you see places you've been in hot spots. You don't see exact coordinates. So it's like, okay, the big tree is over there, the waterfall is somewhere over here. But people uh, read into that map quite a lot because they think it as a straight map, you know. This map is bad because I don't know where the fuck I am. So, so we got really bad 
reviews on, on that thing because we explain that it's your memories like you've been over there you remember being there but uh, it's not exact but people uh, think it is a map and they, they they demand a map when we have that function so yeah it's a problem um, but uh, yeah, can I just? Yeah, uh, uh, but but uh, when we started and people lost their way in this big world, we said well, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's like it's a big world, and you don't have to go anywhere to survive. It, you know, there's different things to to see everywhere. So we started the project with it doesn't really matter where you are, just explore. But yeah, yeah, it's a frustrating for some people because they want to really have control, and uh, for me it's really easy to find myself in a world because I designed it <laughs> so I, I can't really see uh, so I really yeah I'm bad at that I like I play the game a lot and I know the world by heart and yeah, that's that tree and then, then this is over here and so yeah and people uh, well, last week people navigated by the Sun and we have like a Sun that moves every month like now it's over there now it's over here and it's like oh that's south and then what the? no that's south okay I forgot you know so that's also a problem and then we then we put the sun in the map, and then yeah, that just confused everyone. So, <laughs> uh, good questions. Uh, all right. Yeah, you remember me. <laughs> no. uh, you mentioned dynamic events. Can you give some examples of these? Uh, yeah, an example is uh, on the tundra level, there are wolves uh, walking around, mm -hmm. and we don't really have them going after the player, but they go all around the level. Uh, and they are spawned with different delays. Uh, and if you come too close to them, they will start hunt you. And then you can do a few things to escape, like um, killing a deer and just running away, or jumping up to high ground, things like that. Or sacrificing a cub. That yeah, works too. <laughs> if it's not your the slow, the slow one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, back. Uh, how do you handle your playtester? Because I can imagine that a playtester who has been through several iterations might uh, play the game differently from a fresh players. Uh, there's a lot of like friends coming in who aren't uh, gamers in that sense. So we try to show the game to several different people. Uh, but now we have a test group who will come back in January. Um, but yeah, we, we try to have fresh eyes on it. Uh, you talked about giving birth to cubs, so does that mean that you don't start with a set of cubs as you did in chapter one, but you, you gain them through, through events or through pickups or whatever? Or, oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the start of the game is that you are pregnant and you are running from the wolves, and then you have to find them to give birth, and that is the prelude of the yeah. game. by this favorization of cubs that appears in players. Was that something that you noticed in Shelter 1? And in that case, was that something that you wanted to explore further mm -hmm. in Shelter 2? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, shelter 1, uh, uh, that's where we saw it, that people really have their favorite cub. Uh, and that's why we now uh, let people name their cubs, so it's, it gets even more attach to a specific one. So, yeah, it's really interesting and hopefully, yeah. Can you choose not to name certain cubs? They will be named for you then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, have you ever thought of implementing more to increase the emotional bond with your uh, cubs? We always want to implement more, but uh, we can't. At this point, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's not that long of a project, and it's like a really big world, so we had to really scale it down in that sense. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, what's what's something you haven't been able to implement that you would <sighs> when it comes to the emotional bond? Uh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> We've been cutting a lot of features, so I don't really, I don't really know. I think. Uh, I think the naming actually handles it because what we thought was interesting is uh, that players do this themselves. But other than that, yeah, uh, I can't really remember one right now. Sorry. It was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have any 
plans and maybe even ideas about the uh, concept of uh, marking territory as animals. Interesting, no. <laughs> no, actually no. I wish I had come with that uh, idea earlier. <laughs> <laughs> because even if you don't, could that maybe be an excuse for like, uh, navigating the ascent to certain places, like putting <laughs> That's a really good idea, actually. <laughs> we're we're going to uh, think about it. <laughs> I should have done this talk in March. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then you will take over with the architect. Yes. Okay. Uh, as we said in Shelter 1, uh, we designed the patterns, the textures we use in the game, with the, uh, based on common patterns. And the common patterns is family emblems uh, from Japan. So it's like, uh, I, I'm from this family and I'm from this family. So we just love the patterns and uh, the, the, the signia they use. So we, uh, yeah, we base a lot of uh, textures based on those patterns. Uh, well, not we, the, our art director did. So, but in Shelter 2, we uh, wanted to go more Russian. So now we're basing the patterns on Russian Zoom patterns, uh, which I think it's always good when you have like a strong foundation to take something from. Because even though you will not see this, it's something that helps us and and people that know it will read into it. Like, oh, that's cool, because there's probably somewhere on the Russian tundra. Uh, so here's a pack of uh, textures we use for the game, a few of them. And as you can see, there is some Russian patterns in there. Okay, so Shelter 2 uh, is an open world adventure nursing game uh, compared to Shelter 1, which is not open world, just A to B. And the problem we have is that we have only two artists and interns that will leave us next week, unfortunately. Go back to France. Um, so still, abstract textures, but this time based on Russian zoom patterns. May, again, made to look repetitive, but with style. And this time we have thousands of objects in view at the same time, which is a major problem. And uh, the world is very large, so to create this diversity by land, you know, the, here, here's the needle area and here's the grass area. It's, uh, we did that by hand in Shelter 1, but in Shelter 2 the world is so big, so it would be quite impossible to do it nicely. Um, yeah. So this is a picture, a target picture for Shelter 1. Uh, yeah. I, rep I repeat myself now, but... And also, this is an old GIF, it looks much better now, because the grass grows and stuff. But uh, season change in this game, which is a really big task, because snowfall and flowers grow up in summer and the leaf lose... The, this, these are pine trees, so they don't do it, but these will grow and shrink during years, the year go by. Um, and weather effects and all that is, yeah, it was one of the biggest uh, tasks for me to make this uh, uh, doable. And also we have cloud shadows and stuff now. Uh, real time reflections on water. Uh, yeah, and that turns into ice during winter. Um, yeah, so you can imagine this team had a quite a big thing to do, a lot to do. So in Shelter 1, every piece of moss and every piece of low vegetation, like grass patches and everything, was placed by hand. And that was doable because the, the game is quite small. Um, and this we cannot do in a world that's this big. So <laughs> this program made by that guy, which I love. <laughs> Shaderforge in Unity saved the day. Uh, I'm not sure how we would do this, how we could do this without Shaderforge actually arriving on the date it did. Um, so I just took on my uh, scuba uh, set and dived into it and tried to learn shaders in a short period of time. Uh, hopefully I will be back here, wink, during spring and talk more about it. Wink. <laughs> 
because uh, it's really fun and uh, I think it's uh, necessary now if you are a small company that the artists can do the shaders themselves instead of go bother the programmers. I, I don't think you would have enjoyed that too much. And uh, yeah, so Shader Forge is a must. So here's an example on how we created ground diversity. Uh, I will not talk too much uh, technicalities because then I need to talk in Swedish and so on and I will do that in spring probably. Um, so we started off by uh, uh, splatting. Splatting is a term that you tell the shader to use uh, uh, some textures over here and some other textures over here but with the same material and with the same shader. That's only drawing one draw call. Uh, so over here we have a patch of uh, uh, a different ground and here it's like grassy hills and on top of this we do a diffuse splat. So first we uh, diverse this area from this and then we have a uh, diffuse texture that splats it again uh, to different <coughs> textures. So you'll see the results soon here and you know what I mean. This is a GIF I made. So here we have two different areas, here like a grassy one and here it's more, uh, a more rocky one. So, and you see a diffuse that it actually changes textures patch-wise. And thanks to this we could create a large world that feels more natural even though in an abstract way. And also in the shelter one, rocks and, oh sorry, a question. Oh yeah, it's definitely the reason. It's uh, it's our art style, you know. Soft blending is no a big no-no in the shelter world. So yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we placed moss and stuff by hand in shelter one. That was just too too big of a task to handle. So I created this shader that uh, you can add moss on top of stones and just uh, by object or by material. Sorry. You can uh, change which angle this shadow will fall upon it and uh, uh, which angle the, the moss will cover the stones. And as you see, when snow falls on trees and stuff, we can turn them and do whatever we want because it's based on a normal direction uh, on top of the world and going down. So, and also with this system, we could color the shadows. Usually you cannot color shadows in an easy way without color correction. But thanks to this, uh, since I have the light in the, shadow, uh, in the shader, I can decide the color of the sh uh, shadows too. Even though they are just dark here. Um. Yeah, and the snow on the ground uh, grows gradually. So it starts to snow and the snow will cover patterns or the world. This is an old picture, that's why the snow is soft like this, which we decided to do, uh, not to do. But we, had, we didn't really know how to uh, make the snow uh, grow in like uh, triangles and uh, in a hard way that is like the shelter style. So uh, um, our ta talent artist Bastian made a height map in Maya with like strange pyramids. And with this height map, we just lerp the texture into the world like this. So, so it's like a gradient map that first snow appears here, then it grows out like this in a, in a pattern that we choose. And more fun stuff you can do with this is that our, uh, the shaders uh, I created actually knows if there is snow on the ground or not snow on the ground, so the foliage and stuff gets snow on them. Uh, which uh, was also a big help because placing snowy objects on, on snow and uh, objects that are a different prefab on areas that doesn't have any snow is a really big issue. And uh, some nice footsteps that also only appears on snow. And also an easy trick to create diversity in the game. We have a lot of trees that are the same, but by uh, uh, lerping the color uh, to like 20% of a different color based on world position. So if this tree would be placed exactly here, it will also uh, be tinted gray, uh, brown. Sorry. Uh, so just have a little tint on every tree, creates a more dynamic feel to the entire world. Easy tricks that uh, we'll probably I can show you 
later this year, next year. And <laughs> sorry. And uh, here is a trick that I don't think anyone actually realized, but this is like the major thing that makes shelter look as an illustration. As you can see here, this is a stone pattern. And over here is also a stone pattern, but these two is exactly the same size. It ties just as much over here as it ties just as much over here. So depending on the distance the object is from the camera, uh, I actually uh, uh, change the UV scale of the object. So, so a pattern doesn't just clutter the screen in a far away. So you can look, look on objects very, uh, very far away, but still have this nice pattern that is the sensation of shelter. Yes? Does that scale in real time? Yes. Yeah, otherwise it would just be but crap. But uh, uh, applied to every uh, rock? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, on everything. Is it very noticeable when appro approaching? It's, uh, it happens on like certain distances. I think I have four distances that it actually switches. So it is noticeable. But uh, no play testers have ever mentioned it. So it's but I see it. But, but it's in steps, so it's not... Uh, yes, because we didn't want to blend it. Yeah, okay. Because then the patterns will just mush together. So it's also in steps. Yeah. Yeah. And, and get dizzy, I, I suppose, when I, if you are walking up to a rock and the texture kind of warps. Yeah, yeah, if it would blend, yes. This, it's much, uh, much nicer to have a hard edge and also uh, it, the patterns is really the main focus on our game, so it needs to be clear. But yeah, as you can imagine, since every shader has this information in it, every shader is quite big. We actually hit the limit in Shader Forger quite few times because like okay we want every object to get snow on them okay boom a big chunk of information uh, they need to have cloud shadows boom a big sh a chunk of information it needs to do this so the, sh uh, the shaders all grew and grew and grew uh, oh this is the trailer so here you can see a bit of how it looks like in real time Will I, how can I do this without jumping out to the presentation? <laughs> oh. Escape <and> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> need to mail Google. Uh, but that was all for us, so thank you. Thank you.
shall we take questions if there is any? I think we clear them. Yeah. Questions? If there is any? <coughs> yes? Yeah, what was that weird, uh, huge white, yeah. uh, uh, looking thing? It's, that is it. it's when you uh, go into sniff mode and you smell the area, you'll get hints of what is in that general direction. It looks uh, better now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, is there any like, bonus objectives? Uh, maybe quests? No quests. Yeah. <laughs> but no, not. Um, do you want? Uh, talk about the collectibles, I guess. Uh, yeah, we uh, we do have a system with collectible objects that has been a bigger part of the game, and now we're not sure if we're going to keep it. But it's that uh, you can find things like uh, rare rare stones or skulls and things, which you can collect and be a morbid cat and build your own little pile of skulls. So that has been our thought to reward the player for finding uh, specific areas that you can find rare collectibles there. But no, no quests. Uh, I imagine that... <laughs> I imagine that the uh, natural threats for a lynx are rather different from the natural uh, like predators and stuff that would go after a badger. Mm. Uh, how did this uh, how did you work with this? Uh, in uh, in shelter 1 we only had uh, the bird that was like the the predator so we uh, uh, decided to skip that and uh, add the uh, wolves here. So we actually, uh, but shelter one had more dangers like uh, water and fire and uh, uh, darkness. Darkness, exactly. Mm -hmm. When it was dark. So yeah, shelter two. We just decided the wolves is like the next step up. So uh, yeah, it's that actually. Yeah. Starvation is like the big. Uh, danger in shelter too. Oh. Great. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, did you have any other ideas for animals to use? for the second game? Um, we had a lot of discussions on what animals would be cool to make a shelter game of, um, but we haven't gone away from doing it as a Lynx game. Mm. But the discussion, I don't think... We, no, there was no discussion, because uh, Jacob, uh, our art director, presented the idea and everyone loved it, so it was just, yeah, let's do it. So, no. But uh, we're talking about the third one. <laughs> <laughs> and we have lots of ideas. <laughs> So, my favorite is a penguin, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm guessing all of you have uh, different roles, so there's someone that's, uh, uh, that has the role of a designer, but can you all contribute with uh, your ideas? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we are a small team, so everyone contributes with ideas. If it's good, it's like uh, hooked up instantly. So yeah, absolutely. Do you ever yeah. meet any other uh, linkses? I well, I don't want to answer that actually. <laughs> it will be a secret. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Yeah.